<laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Wonderful. <laughs> All the time. I know it. Oh, you know, I just, uh, as Tracy was chatting, we are talking about the, uh, the event with Tommy. Um, I'm, I'm reminded about, I've mentioned this a few times, I think, but I'm reminded about, reminded about an event we had here in 2009, 2018 when we had the team from India. Yeah. And we had uh, uh, Benito, our good friend, you know, friend of the church here, and then Terrence was here as well, who's a good friend of Benito. And uh, we did a how to share the gospel night. And like, walking around with the Indians in India, they share the gospel with everybody. It's just, it's just natural recourse for them. And uh, I remember when Benito asked the question, or one of them asked the question, how many of you have ever been to a training event about how to share your faith, how to share the gospel? And I don't think a single hand went up in the midst of us. There were 40 or 50 of us in the, in the event. And it, it just, it dawned on me. I was just thinking back, like, you know, we've had good training on prophetic ministry, on healing, and, and you know, talking here about encountering the Holy Spirit, We've had all this good training at, at SCC, but at churches across North America, right? But one of the most overlooked elements of our faith is how do you share the gospel? How do you even understand how to articulate it? And, and so I love hearing, you know, all, all just people across the nation are going, we need to learn how to share this again. We need to learn how to re-engage the culture with faith. I, I um, it's just a it's just a beautiful thing. So I'm very encouraged. I loved what Tracy the, um, the Luke 22 verse. You know, I th I do really think that's a word for you this morning. Is uh, it says they found the thing just as Jesus had said it would be. You know, for many of us, there's things that God has spoken to us about. And he said, this is what I intend to do with you, or this is where I intend to send you, or this is who you are, and this is what you'll do. And there's, a, there's this delay between the speaking of God and the fulfillment of God. And there's a long season, season of frustration, usually, in the midst of that. Yes, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Most definitely. Most definitely. Yes. We're going to talk about that. Yes, 100% yes. And I love just, just the prophetic sense of that verse. You know, you think from the moment they said it to the anticipation, is it going to actually be there like he said it would? And the scriptures affirm, what he told you it was going to be like, it is. And now for them, they didn't have to wait years and years and years and years. For some of us, it's years and years and years. For some, it's moments. For some, it's years. For some, it's days. But take heart in that. See, there's, there's, this, there's this part of the journey that's called preparation. <laughs> and, and in fact, preparation is the whole journey. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. What you get in the preparation is what you get in the promise. There's one early church father who said the, the practice, or the promise is realized within the practice itself. So you practice for the presence of God, and what do you get? The promise. You practice for the promise. You know, I'm going to have a great, think about someone like Tommy when he was young. I'd imagine the Lord speaks to him, you're going to have a great evangelistic ministry. Well, the practice is in the promise, or the promise is in the practice. You practice what you do, and the promise is realized. So you get the outcome on a daily basis, but you get the full realization as you're prepared and walk into it. I, I want to read, um, I'm gonna, there's a number of things I want to touch on this morning on, you know, we're in this, this series on uh, the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
the encountering his presence, and Tracy asked me to talk on the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, which is like, you know, not vague enough, right? (laughs) I want to read this excerpt from a 12th century Christian mystic. It's a poem that he wrote about the presence of God, and he says this, and then I'm going to go into a number of different things. Uh, His name was uh, Simeon the New Theologian, an Eastern, Eastern... Christian mystic. It says this, he's, he is seen by me and he looks at me, he being God. He is seen by me and he looks at me. He who looks upon all things. Amazed, I am astonished at the shapeliness of his beauty and how the creator stooped down when he opened the heavens and displayed his unspeakable and strange glory to me. Who therefore shall also come closer to him? Or how shall one be carried up to the immeasurable heights? When I consider this, he himself was found within me, flashing forth within my wretched heart, illuminating me from all directions with immortal radiance, shining upon all my members with his rays, folding his entire self around me, he tenderly kisses all of me. He gives his whole self to me, the unworthy, and takes my fill of his love and beauty. And I am filled full of divine pleasure and sweetness. And if that doesn't perfectly encapsulate the journey of transformation, I don't know what does. The encounter of divine pleasure and sweetness. When I was um, going back into the history of Josh, uh, you know, I I was raised in church. but my parents divorced when I was 18, which was a very difficult season uh, for any of you who are, who are children of divorced families. It's, you know, the existential crisis that comes over you when your, ho- your home life falls apart. And for varying degrees, you know, you've got everywhere from people experiencing that at, as an infant all the way up till, you know, adult. It impacts you in different ways, but it's a deeply impactful and traumatic event. And I spent a number of years um, essentially going, my parents were leaders within the, every church that we ever went to, and I spent a number of years essentially saying to the world <laughs> in an unspoken way, if this is what God's like, I don't want to have anything to do with them. That was way too hurtful and painful. And, um, you know, the Lord, the Lord really found me when I was about the age of 23, 24, it was um, was a seven-year journey of the moment between my parents' divorce and uh, when I really came into a relationship, a fully realized relationship with the Lord. Um, But you know, everything wasn't fixed. Everything still isn't fixed. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> well, the funny thing about that is I, I, the better I get, the more broken I realized I am, right? <laughs> if I could just be 20 again, <laughs> I'd be perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. <laughs> And along the way, you know, I I, um, I, get, I started getting involved with, uh, it was a vineyard church down in California. Um, I started getting involved with this church um, quite a bit and got involved in a Bible study, was meeting with the pastor regularly, and there was a, a group of uh, five of us that were all kind of right around my age, mid to late 20s, and we were kind of gung-ho for the gospel, so we would go out. We had a we would go out to um, a local farmers market that was a huge farmers market. You know, fifteen thousand people would come each night or each each. In California, you can run these things year round. You know, outside and so it would run year round. And we would go and we'd share the gospel and all this kind of stuff. It was it was great fun. And eventually, we had a booth there. And and we we I was part of this um, group of young adults, and we decided we would launch a uh, a young adult church that met Sunday nights. We called it The Burn. Really clever name. <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, and it was hopping. It was really, really good. You know, we had a, at least 100 young adults coming out um, and all worship leaders coming from all over the region. And it was just awesome. And meanwhile, while that's happening, and I'm in this, I'm in this nucleus of five young men who are walking with this pastor to launch this young adult thing, having a great time with it. And um, I'm just trying to think of how many stories to tell you about my failures. Um, <laughs> the first time they asked me to give a, any kind of announcement, I said, okay, Josh, you're going to do the announcements. And the pastor said, um, okay, just whatever you do, you, if you're going to tell people, we didn't take an offering or anything because it was young adults. So if, you, if you're going to say anything, just point people back, say there's a box in the back. If you want to leave an offering, there's a box in the back, right? He says, don't say things like, we don't pass the envelopes here. We don't pass the bags here or anything like that. Don't say anything like that. Just, just it's nondescript. You know, there's a box in the back. So what did I do? I got up. I was incredibly nervous. And I said, very first thing out of my mouth, we don't pass the bags here. <laughs> We don't have any envelopes here. I couldn't think of what to say. I just thought, what did he talk about? Oh, that's right. <laughs> so the very thing he said, <laughs> they didn't have me do announcements again. <laughs> Young Josh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've forgiven them, okay. <laughs> um. Mean, so I'm in this nucleus of young adults, and we've, we've launched this thing, and it's really exciting. Meanwhile, Josh has a double life. Because, you know, I met Jesus in a pretty dramatic fashion and started getting involved in the church here, but... Between that time of my parents' divorce and that moment, I'd fallen in with a relatively rough crowd. And, um, you know, we were, my house was the party house. Like it was, the cops would just show up at my house every weekend because that was just, they knew there would be a party there. <laughs> and one of our roommates was notorious for selling um, painkillers, prescription painkillers. And there was, drug paraphernalia all over our house all the time. It was just the way our house was. And the guys I was hanging out with started to get into harder and harder substances. And, um, and so I had, I had gotten out of a decent amount of that by the time I was involved with the young adult group. But some of these guys were still my friends. And so, you know, I would still go and they'd call me up, hey, we're going to go to this party, we're going to go to this bar. And they were my friends, so I went with them. And so I would go out, and I would just have this miserable crash, a moral crash. And then I'd come back to the group, but I didn't want to tell them anything about it because I was afraid of being ostracized. So I'd hide what I was doing over here. None of them knew about it. And meanwhile, I would pretend that I was good Christian Josh over here because I wanted to be able to give another, another announcement message. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm being given more responsibility over here. Right? I'm leading a home group now with the young adults, involved more in prophetic ministry, this kind of stuff, and I'm failing miserably over here. And I can't control this. I can't control myself in this situation. And I don't know why it keeps happening. Oh, I'll, I'll, it'll be fine this time. I'll go hang out with these guys. It'll be fine. You know, I can do it, right? <laughs> no, I can't. Peer pressure is a real thing. But I can't say anything over here because if they find out about that over there, they're not going to let me do these things over here, and I like the responsibility. I was really struggling. And I, I remember it coming to a head at the end of 2006, and uh, one of the worst times when you're involved in that crowd is New Year's Eve celebrations. And it just, it just failed miserably. And I was, I was at the lowest point 
And I was just, I remember saying to God, because he's very real to me at this point, but I just couldn't get it under control. I remember saying to God, like, I can't keep doing this. I can't, you have to meet, you either have to meet me in a dramatic way, or I've just got to be done with it and go embrace this lifestyle full, full stop. Something has to change. I can't keep living under the pressure of this dual life. Hiding it on one hand over, and, and by the way, hiding from these people over here what was happening over here, right? I couldn't talk to them about this because they would ostracize me as well. Any hint of that and you're a Jesus freak. So I felt very torn and I didn't know what to do about it. And I was ready to give up on the whole Christian thing. Not because I didn't believe in God, not because he wasn't real to me or anything, but because that struggle was too much. And meanwhile, over here, I'd had some pretty fantastic experiences with the Lord. Like he'd really met me. I understood, I understood the depth of his love and this kind of stuff. I'd been touched by that. I'd had moments and encounters where I was sobbing like a just snot everywhere. So it's not like this wasn't happening over here with him. It's just that this over here was still going on. And so I remember having a conversation with my dad. You know, my dad knew I was struggling, um, even though I, he, he, I worked with him, and he could, you know, parents are pretty smart, usually. And um, I'm a parent, so I have to say usually. And, and so I know I, I, he could tell that I'm struggling, and he, says, he said to me, look, there's this conference coming up at this church, and it's, this, was, this is at uh, Bethel in Reading. He says, there's this conference coming up, you know, John Paul Jackson's going to be there. These other prophetic guys are going to be there. I'll pay for your registration. And I had been talking like I thought, well, maybe if I go to like a ministry school or something, it'll get better, right? Looking for some kind of answer. He says, why don't you just go check the place out? I'll pay for your registration and you go by yourself with no one else. And I said, okay. And that's a seven hour drive, right? To get there from where I was. California's pretty big. And um, this is in February of 2007. So I'm, I basically went, okay, this is my last ditch effort. <laughs> I'll do this, right? I'll go check it out and get away and find out, you know, if I can be this person over here full time. And um, I went to that conference, you know, for a 20, what was I, 20, I was 25. So for a 25 year old, that was a pretty big deal to drive that far and invest all by myself, you know, and I, I was not the kind of person that wanted to be alone at that point. Now I'm the kind of person who loves silence, you know, studying the lives of monastic figures throughout church history will do that to you. But then I wanted to be around people, so it was a big deal, right? And I, I think in the best, the best term that I could use to describe what happened to me, happened to me at that conference was that I got schmoed by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> schmoed. I don't, I don't even really remember what happened. I just remember weeping all the time. I remember crying. I remember sweating. I remember being, feeling like I was, I felt like I was on fire for three straight days. And I, everything changed. I remember like, like before that I decided, you know, I, I was gonna, everybody said you're supposed to read the Bible. So I was going to read the Bible from front to front to back. Right. So I did that. This was probably 2006 before I went, I read the Bible from front to back and I decided I was going to start praying. And I sat down to pray one morning, and I just gave up after 30 seconds. I said, this is too hard. I'm going to read the Bible again. After, after that conference, I remember sitting down to pray and going, I can feel him. He's here. Everything's changed. If I sit, he's there with me. It's no longer me trying to do something in forcefulness of will, but it, he's there. And so I don't, it's not even, like, prayer is not even praying when he's there. It's just being with him. Right? We're like, we use the term prayer to describe lots of different things, but that it was just like I could sit. I remember sitting and feeling and going, there's someone here with me. I remember writing a list of 10 points of things I wanted to see accomplished in my life. Everything started changing. This is in the hotel room at the conference. Right? Everything started. I still have the binder they gave us, actually, with the list on it. <laughs> and every one of them, actually, by the way, has been fulfilled. 
And I, I left, that, that was, they, G, um, uh, Jesus Culture had just released their first worship album. And, you know, at that point they had, I think there was four tracks of just praying on that album, you know, back when they used to do that. And I, I bought that album there, and seven hour drive home, it was just on repeat in the car, and I was just weeping and weeping and weeping convinced and convicted of his love for me and for all of his creation. I remember reading at some point in there uh, a number of the verses in the Proverbs that talk about how he will refine us as silver and remove the dross from our life. And it dawns on me, I'm sweating like I'm on fire, and I'm going, he's doing this, he's burning it all up. And, and I was a, uh, at, up, up until that point, I was what you might have described as an audiophile. I loved music. I still love music. It's not like it changed. But, but like Aaron at one point, we, were, we have a, had a friend a number of years ago. This is before Aaron and I were even dating. But our friend was, a, uh, English was their second language. Um, and so they were trying to figure out what the word pretentious meant. And Aaron said, we know how Josh is with music. So that's, <laughs> and, and uh, I had discovered that you could download music for free. <laughs> and so I had, I mean, I had a huge category of music and I would go to music shows. Like I wanted to discover every indie artist I'd travel. I'd w- been to Berkeley to the theater in the round to see Modest Mouse and the Flaming Lips. Like, I mean, I, I went to see the bands that were up and coming, all the indie bands and everything. I was heavily involved in the scene. This was my thing, right? I loved this. And this is one of the things I shared with some of my friends there. We were, we were into music. I was part of, you know, we'd go to a bar that had a music show. I saw lots of, lots of the popular bands and the up-and-coming bands back then. And I remember leaving that conference and putting that Jesus Culture CD on, and for the next year and a half, I couldn't listen to anything else. I I couldn't turn, if I turned on any other music, not secular music is fine. There's some, there's actually some beautiful music. I don't, I have no problem with any kind of music. I just couldn't, if I turned it on, my stomach would just turn. I'd get nauseous. I couldn't help it. So all I could do is listen to worship. So I realized that within the first couple days. So I tried to find Christian music downloading sites where I could get music for free that was Christian music. And so then I started to download the first thing, and I couldn't download it. I was like, this is wrong. I can't do this anymore. So what am I spo- <laughs> I just started spending money on iTunes. I never spend money for music. <laughs> My point is, at, like, from, like, I was stripped back to the seams and rebuilt, and every value changed. And I only knew as I butted up against my old value. I couldn't go, like my friends would call. I'd get nauseous at the thought of going out with them. I I went out one time and I stood outside of the bar that they wanted to go to. I couldn't go in. I felt nauseous just being there. Like my stomach turned. I couldn't. Everything had changed. Everything. And I had to work this out, you know. But here's the thing. Like at that point, I had struggled with a pornography addiction too. Right? Drugs, alcohol, pornography, it all goes together. I'd struggled with all of that. That changed like that. I couldn't, like, I was an avid video gamer at that point. I couldn't play a video game. I couldn't turn a TV on. Literally, the only thing I did was I would leave for work, and I would put the IHOP prayer room live stream on in my room. You had to subscribe to it at that point. It's five bucks a month. And I would play the audio, I'd play the audio thing, just, that was the only thing that ever went on in my room. I would leave to work and I'd come home and I had a giant beanbag chair, it was amazing. And I would just sit in it for hours at a time with the Father. I'd fast, I'd pray, it was all I could do was orient my life around him because I'd met him in the core of my being. And everything about my life changed in that moment. Now that's not to say, again, that's not to say that I was perfect because the father starts unpacking and revealing ways I dealt, ways that 
fear had dominated my life or anger had dominated my life. Like, I remember I was in a basketball game when I was 18, and one of the other players tripped my friend who was playing, and I was playing also, and I ran across the court and tackled him. <laughs> like, that was an angry man. Yeah, it was a wrong sport. That's right. I tackled two of them, actually. I got mad at a ref once, and so I started taking the chairs and throwing them onto the court and yelling at them. Very uncouth language. I got kicked out of that basketball league. I got suspended multiple times from the basketball league. Yeah. It was a good decision. But I'd still say some of those refs were really bad. So it wasn't like anger just dried up immediately. It wasn't like, and I, actually the Lord's still unpacking layers of where that has come from. Right? He's still perfecting that in me. And he's still softening me. Same with fear. He's still revealing layers of that. Uh, here, here's, here's what I want to say, okay, in telling you all of that. The brokenness of Josh. And the ways I'm, I'm continually coming to grips with what has happened to me, whether it's been formed by, the, like, like, you know, I didn't realize how twisted um, my ideas of sex were until I got married. Right? I, you just don't know because you're not confronted with it. But then you're confronted with it and you're like, oh my goodness, I have a lot of expectations that I can't tell if they're driven by the addiction to pornography I used to have or a healthy expectation of what sex should be in marriage. I can't tell. And so I had to have honest, vulnerable conversations with my wife. I don't know. Right? I'm, this is being rebuilt from the ground up. I don't know until I see it. So it's a constant journey and a constant process. But I recognize that things I did, like Proverbs says, it's the foolishness of man that perverts his way. I can be poster child for that. I don't know, many of you could say the same thing here. Every one of us could. That there's things I did and there's things that were done to me that seriously disintegrated and desecrated my humanity and who I am as a human being. That I'm constantly at odds with. Galatians says this in Galatians 5, that the flesh and the spirit wrestle against each other. Actually, the struggle proves that redemption is ongoing. Because if you didn't struggle, it would just be the flesh winning all the time. But if you struggle, it means the spirit is actually making progress. So that inner war and that inner battle, that's a good thing. Don't give up. Don't quit. That's a good thing. So here, here's, here's what I want to say is sometimes when I observe the way we communicate and the way, the way we talk as a church, not just SEC, I'm talking about church in general, but I'm including us in that as well is that sometimes I fear that we've become very comfortable, comfortable with a gospel that essentially says the Holy Spirit gives you the strength to bear your burdens, but the Holy Spirit doesn't come to set you free from your sin. That we can, well, okay, you know, I'm anxious and depressed. Well, the Holy Spirit will come alongside you and comfort you, but will he free you from that anxiety and depression? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. But if we exchanged one for the other in our thought process in Western society, in church, in Christianity, do we actually believe? Like, like and here's the thing, right? Because it's very easy for us to conceptually say, well, yes. But now let's bring it right down to the locus point of the particular individual. Do you believe he will do it for you? Because we can articulate a theological point without believing a theological point. If you, statistics say, okay, between the ages of 17 and 40, like just talk about pornography for one. Statistics say, and I'm not going to get you to raise your hands. Statistics say, on, uh, we'll just talk about pastors. I won't get the pastors to raise their hand. <laughs> Freddie's not in the room, so. 50% of pastors are addicted to pornography. Statistics say that. 
the number's even higher for your average population. 70%. When it comes to the men between 17 and 49 here in the room, statistics say 70%. Watch pornography at least a couple times a month. That's what, that's what the statistics say. The number is typically less with women, but it's still there with women as well. So we can articulate a gospel that says, sure, the Holy Spirit brings freedom, but will he bring freedom to the lust that overwhelms me in that particular moment? I've talked to good Christian leaders that, you know, on a, on a ministry trip or a business trip or whatever, when they get into their hotel room by themselves, they have a hard time not ordering a pornographic channel on the TV. Good Christian men who are struggling with that. Who could articulate to you a gospel of the Holy Spirit's empowering presence to bring freedom, but in their practical everyday life, it's non-existent. He sees me, he knows me, accepts me, he loves me, he's kind, he's tender. You could say all that kind of stuff. But one of the very first things Jesus said about his ministry is he quoted Isaiah 61. It said he was going to set free the captives. So do we still believe there's a gospel that says the Holy Spirit is going to come and set you free from your sin? Or have we come, become complacent I said, well, anxiety is just the way of my life. Depression is just the way of my life. Fear is just the way of my life. Anger is just the way of my life. Lust and desire is just the way of my life. Addiction is just the way of my life. See, see, Paul was actually dealing with this. Just turn with me. Galatians 5. I just want to point a couple things out, okay? You guys are all going to be very familiar with this passage in Galatians 5. So here, here, here's just a thought experiment, right, right before we get into this. Take, um, let's first externalize this. Take a person in your life who you would say is the most hopeless case. Could never happen. Transformation could never happen. You've just, you've just, they're just a constant, ugh, this person's just stuck. Just take that person in your life. You know, maybe it's a brother, sister, friend, whatever. Just that person that they just constantly stuck. Do you believe, looking at that person, do you believe, can that person be absolutely transformed in one, like I was transformed in one second. Now there's a lifetime, I'm, I know that, but do you believe, this is where it comes down, where the rubber, where the rubber hits the road. You can articulate a theological position, but do you believe it could happen in that relationship? Maybe it's a husband and wife, maybe it's a father or mother, maybe it's a son or a daughter. Do you actually believe the Holy Spirit will, will not just can, but would touch that person's life and radically transform that person? Because we can articulate a belief, but when I localize it to the person, have I lost hope? Or let's say with myself. And whether it's a struggle with pornography, a struggle with anger, a struggle with uncontrollable thought life, you know, all these things that we struggle with. Well, I believe they could do it with that person, but can they do it with me? Do I believe that in the moment that lust begins to overwhelm me, the Holy Spirit can empower me and enable me to become free from that addiction? He never gives up on you. It says, Paul says this. We're just going to walk through this. Okay? 
Uh, starting in verse 16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusts against the spirit or wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish, right? He's calling back to Romans seven and eight. We've talked about that. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now I'm going to bring some, I think some clarity and context to this for you. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. The word fornication, by the way, is the Greek word porneo. It's where we would get the word pornography from. It means sexual immorality. It just doesn't mean sleeping with other people. Okay? Works of the flesh. Um, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. So in case you get like, well, I don't do idolatry and sorcery anymore. But outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Heresies would be not being able to think clearly, by the way. Envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That, by the way, the kingdom of God doesn't mean eternal life. The kingdom of God means the rule and reign of God here and now. It means entering into and participating his life here and now. There's things that set themselves up against the kingdom of God. Okay. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. You guys are very familiar with that passage, right? The question here, now getting into the mindset of a first century Jew, the question here, when it says things like following the Spirit, we have particular connotations, we think, or the lust warring against the flesh. What Paul is saying is, what is the life within you that animates you? The life within you that animates you will lead to these kind of things. So he's not saying, okay, practice peace, peace and the Holy Spirit will be with you. He's saying, no, if the life that animates you is the Spirit of God, peace will be the byproduct of that life. If the life that animates you is the life of the flesh, then ambition, selfishness, pride, envy, and deceit, those will all be the parts of your life that you struggle with because the flesh is animating you. Not your body. It doesn't mean body. It's the Greek word sarx, and it means what the carnal nature is. The way the world is. What animates your life? What fills you? Like, think about it, right? When, when every single one of you has struggled with a temptation, when you give yourself into the temptation, it gives you a shot of whether it's dopamine, whether it's energy, whatever it happens to be, there's a bio, biochemical response that actually makes you feel euphoric because the life within you is being animated by the actions. Just flip back over with me for a second to Galatians 4. We'll just start at verse 3, 4, 4 verse 3. Because this, you know, Paul's telling you what the struggle is like, but he's already given you the answer. Even so, when we were children, we were born in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that they might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son, and it's a, as a son, an heir of God through Christ. Just a beautiful passage, right? That is, look, look okay, <laughs> I know, you've got to bear with me. I'm going to take a couple extra minutes here, all right? There's a, where I wrote this verse down somewhere. <laughs> Psalm, so keep, keep Galatians 4 right there. Keep your thumb right there. Go to Psalm 53 with me, okay? Okay, it's actually, this is, Psalm 53 is a, uh, this is almost the exact same psalm as I think Psalm 16. It says this, verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. 
They are corrupt and have, have done abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. The, actually, the, the, in the Hebrew, the word there is isn't there. It's just a statement. The fool has said in his heart, no God. Not there is, it's not like no God exists. It's saying no God's in here. Okay? The fool has said in his heart, no God. The spirit is sent into your heart to cry out, Abba, Father. That's a radical transformation. Right? That's a big difference. So the, the spirit goes into your heart, cries out, Abba, Father. Because Here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. Here's, when we talk about the love of God, what we tend to mean is that God loves me and accepts me. That's a totally wrong context. When we talk about the love of God, when the spirit cries into your heart, falls into your heart, cries, you're crying, Abba, Father. You're no longer thinking about whether you're accepted or loved. You're thinking about how amazing he is. It reorients your vision away from this onto him. So it no longer matters if I'm accepted and loved because he's beautiful and amazing. My whole life, every characteristic of my life has been taken off of this carnal, fleshly nature, and now I can't help but see him. And when I look at anything else, I actually get nauseous because it's his spirit in me and his, in, his living in me now. Right? Paul says, it's like, it's like we say these as theological realities. Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Look, at, you could say it like this, what Paul says. When Paul says that, he's saying, I no longer live, but love lives itself through me. I'm not even living in here anymore. He is. That's the Holy Spirit does something radical and transformative. He doesn't just give you strength to struggle through your everyday life, he radically transforms you. And sometimes we go from one struggle to the next, not real, and that's fine. You know, I'm not saying that he doesn't give you strength to bear with the difficulties. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that's not his intended goal in the outworking of the whole thing. Right? He does give you strength to bear with difficulties, but he also longs to transform you. Right? He sends, like, like, I don't have time to unpack this whole thing, but the Spirit is the love of God. He sends it into your heart and it cries out, Abba, Father, because you're no longer concerned about whether you're loved or accepted or anything. All you're doing is seeing him because his love is actually living itself in you. And it's not so much that you experience him, but now he experiences you. Okay, and here's how I know that, because Paul says this, but then indeed, there's a very next verse in verse eight, then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. Right? That's the life of the flesh. But now, after you have known God, listen to this. I just caught this the other day. I never even noticed this before. They just put this in here. <laughs> but now, after you have known God, right? Well, we know God. We know all the theological realities. We know the right statements and all those kind of things. Now that you have known God, and then Paul says, or rather are known by God. And that's the question. How many of you could say, oh, I know God. How many of you could say, I'm known by God? That's a big difference. I've actually divulged everything to him and he knows me thoroughly and completely. And he's familiar with me because I've spent time with him and I know that he's with me and I know that he knows me and he speaks to me and he leads me and guides me and lives his life in me. It's one thing to say, I know God. It's an entirely different thing to say, I'm known by him. Now we know God is omniscient and eternal and all that stuff. He knows every one of us, okay? But I, like, like this maybe this is a bad example, but like my wife is human, so I know what she's like because she's human. But I, she doesn't know me unless I come into contact with her, right? I could say I know her because she's a human and she's a female and I know what makes a human and a female, but she, she, I, she doesn't know me until I come to her and I reveal myself to her, right? If I, I can say I know something, but am I known by him? That's the big question because that's the crossing point. Like I would say at that point in my life in 2007 when that ha happened, that's when I started to be known by God because now I've entered into covenant relationship. Now what's more important to me is him, not me. Now what's more important to me is walking with him and not walking with these things over here. 
And he, as he strengthens me and enables me and empowers me, but it's because I've been taken from this and I've been put over here and now I'm known by him and I'm opening my heart and he's searching and he's revealing what he finds in there. And that's the lifelong journey. The gospel is not intended to give you strength to bear any duress that you're under. The gospel is intended to give you freedom from a life of carnality. The things that dominate and control you that are so linked into our body that every single one of those things that Paul references as works of the flesh are significantly connected to a particular biochemical response in your body that gives you a euphoric feeling. The Father intends you to free you from that. But we have to be honest about it. We can't pretend like it doesn't exist. It will drive you crazy trying to hide yourself like that. Can I get the worship team to come up, please? See, when, when, when the cry of your heart is Abba, Father, the cry, that means the cry of your heart is no longer lust and desire. When the cry of your heart is Abba, Father, it means the cry of your heart is no longer anger and fear. When the cry of your heart is Abba, Father, it means the cry of your heart is no longer anxiety and despair because something has radically shifted. That doesn't mean the circumstances shift because God deals with the inside before dealing with the outside. Okay, like we want to see radical change in society. We want to see institutional reform, and so we rail against the institutions. God works from the inside out, not the outside in. He changes the hearts of people, then sends them into the place. And so we want people that don't know God to change the way they're doing things. Why would we expect that? He intends to change you and then send you. The greatest witness like, think about this. The greatest witness of Christ's presence on earth is, hu is humble, radical love. Like, like there's nothing else that, that provokes people to look at it and go, why would you suffer like that? Why would, you know, Mother Teresa, why would you go clean the lepers like that? There's nothing else that provokes, like, like, she wasn't like, Mother Teresa wasn't a great theologian. But, she, but we look at him, we just go, that's baffling. Someone that would love that deeply and sacrifice that selflessly. It's the most incredible witness is what the Holy Spirit does in you to free you from yourself. And freedom, by the way, isn't license to do whatever you want. Freedom is to finally become the very thing your heart longs for, which is him. It's him. This is how Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13. He says the destination, or, or and John says this in 1 John 3. Like, beloved, we don't even know where we're gonna, what we're going to look like, but we know it's going to be like him. We're not even sure what it looks like, but we know it's going to look like him. So he longs that our every place where anger and fear has been crying out in your heart to replace it with an Abba Father cry. And that's a journey. I'm not saying that, that there's things that happen instantaneously, yes. I don't know why God does it that way. But things that he frees you from instantaneously, but there's lifelong things that he intends to reveal, I think, I suspect, is so that you have grace and uh, influence among other people that would struggle with that so that you could bring freedom to them as well. And you gain a heart of compassion and love. I, 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 uh, su I suspect that that's what it is, but I don't know why. I don't know all the reasons why. For some reason, in 2007, he freed me from certain bondages in my life, but other ones have been things that he's decided over time we're going to unpack these things. That's his prerogative. But today, today may be a day where he just nudges the path a little bit further along. Where he just goes, let's come and let's nudge it just a little further along. Let's push you just a little further along. Whether it's a struggle with pornography, whether it's a struggle with fear, whether it's a struggle with lust, whether it's a struggle with unclean thoughts, whether I can't seem to grasp and control what's coming against me, whatever it happens to be, right? There's a battle going on and the Holy Spirit comes and intends to free you and give you victory so that the cry of your heart is no longer anger and fear, but it's all the Father. Why don't we stand?
So this is, what I, this is the invitation this morning. If you want a shot in the arm, <laughs> maybe that's a bad way of saying that now. There's <laughs> societal trauma. <laughs> I know. <laughs> if you were triggered, you need prayer. You know, there's every single one of us could use it. The establishment of grace in an ever deepening way in the midst of what we're struggling with. Whether it's, you know, like our society describes and defines categories of sin and, you know, one through ten, right? Pornography is a ten and fear is a one. But every one of them dominates how we live our lives. God doesn't go, well, they're in order of importance there. All right, actually, he says the root of it all is greed. So, so it's not like he's categorizing it. Every one of us needs help. Every one of us needs to make the journey from, Abba Fa- from fear, anger, desire, lust to Abba Father. We're all on that trajectory. Right, the challenge that I want to give to you today is to reestablish hope that things could change to reestablish hope that things could change, whether in the people around you that you've lost hope in or whether in yourself or both, that things can change. Because the Holy Spirit is not inactive. He's in the business of transformation. And I know he's done a lot in each one of you already, but he intends to do more. And so the invitation to respond right now that the Holy Spirit would bear witness in your heart, the cry of Abba Father would be strengthened this morning. The struggle would be strengthened this morning. The struggle against those things, not to bear those things, but to struggle against those things. That that's the invitation this morning. And I wanna pray for you, I wanna lay hands on you, that the Holy Spirit would touch you and would enable you and would strengthen you. That the Holy Spirit, that the Abba Father would increase in your heart. And I believe this morning can be, for some of you, it's been a real painful struggle. And I believe this morning can be a moment of freedom for you. And so I want to invite anybody that, you know, you're stirred, whatever, come down here. I'm going to lay hands on you. The ministry team's going to lay hands on you. Okay, whether it's anger, whether it's fear, whether it's lust, whether it's selfishness, whether it's pride, whether it's greed, whatever it is, the thing that you can't seem to kick, the Holy Spirit intends to make clear today that his voice is stronger than that voice. So the invitation here is a moment of encounter. The encounter with the Abba Father. The encounter with the loving, tender, wise God that reorients and shifts everything from yourself to him. It's a big difference between no God in the heart and Abba Father in the heart. That's the journey. So we're going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit touches you in in a significant way. still space for anyone that's still thinking about it there's still space Jesus Jesus we're going to spend time in this moment so if you need I know if you need to go you can go that's fine I just ask if you're if you're going to hang around just go please go into the foyer coffee, all that kind of stuff is there. Just just let's protect this place because the Holy Spirit really wants to minister. Jesus, Jesus. Ministry, te- te- ministry team, you can go around. 
I'm going to come in just a sec, but just, you know, if you feel that stirring. And he can, pre- he can break the power of anger just like that. He can break the fear of outcomes. What if, what if, what if. Fear paralyzes you from being able to make decisions. He can break that. The Abba Father, the trust and the faithfulness, he can break that. I can't just seem to think straight. He can break that. He can bring clarity. He doesn't give you in you a spirit of fear, but of sound mind. He can break that. He can bring clarity to thoughts. If that's you struggling, I can't seem to get my mind focused. He can bring clarity. Five irresistible desires. I can't, I don't understand. I can't, I keep acting on them. He can come in there. He can break that. it's not even that he can it's that he longs to see that here's one thing for you all of you that are up here now and you that are back there the Holy Spirit is the furious longing of God for his people the furious longing of God he sent it into your heart the furious longing of God for you Spirit, come, 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 increase in every way, even now.